Angela. Amen. Angela has been 
Samuel. Amen. And I uh, also want to give honor to uh, Pastor Keith Hudson. Uh, stand up, brothers. Yeah. 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 So I thank God for all of you that are here. And uh, let me see what time it is. Okay, so let's start with uh, the Hebrew songbook. Um, division number 38. I mean 32. Division 32. Psalms. And um, we'll start with verse 8. Hebrew songbook, the book of Psalms 32, verse 8, God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. So here's what I would say. Um, um, you know, and I encourage you to take notes when the Holy Spirit alerts you. To do so, and um, so here's where I want to start. Purpose is what you were born to do. So you might want to write that down. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. So purpose is what you were born to do. Passion is what you love to do. I'll go slow. As slow as I can go. Purpose is what you're born to do. Passion is what you love to do. And gifting is what you're empowered to do. Pastor, great to see you, man of God. This Pastor Tony, let's give him a big hand. Amen. Purpose is what you're born to do. Passion is what you love to do. And gifting is what you're empowered to do. Amen. You have a desire a desire can be or passion could be either something that you have decided or depending upon the degree of your surrender to the Holy Spirit that desire can be God given but you must marry you must marry design with desire. Because the issue becomes what are you designed by God to do? And anytime you have a desire outside of your design, you're going to find yourself frustrated. Mm. Because that's not something you're designed to do. So it's very important that you marry your design with desire and to make sure that the desire you have comes from God himself. 
Now, in connection with this, the scripture is very clear, and I think I'll just turn to it, turn to the book of Philippians. says something very interesting. Chapter 2. And this is only true if you're surrendered to the Holy Spirit and if you're obedient to the word of the Lord. It says here in verse number 13, for it is God who works in you, giving you both the will or the desire and the ability to do his good pleasure. So, the best way to make sure that your desire is God-given is to submit yourself to the Lord. And yield yourselves unto God. And yield yourselves to the Lord to make sure that he's the one that gives you his desire. Mm -hmm. It is God who works in you, giving you both the will and to do his good pleasure or the desire and the ability to do his good pleasure. Now, turn back over to the Hebrew songbook. To a very familiar passage of scripture. 37, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, which basically means to praise and worship God. It means to let the Father be your delight. Let the Lord Jesus be your delight. Let the Holy Spirit be your delight. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, you could look at this and say, whatever your heart desire is, he'll give it to you. Or you could look at it and say, he puts the desires of his heart into yours. Now, anytime you have a desire that's outside of how you've been designed by the uh, things are not going to work very well for you. So, I need to find out who and what he wants me to be. Because that's where I'm going to see the best and the greatest. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's very interesting, and I'll say this to you, and you can go back to, back to Philippians now. Ephesians, Philippians. It says in verse 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But it says something, very interesting in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, in the reverence of the Lord. But here's the point. Only to the degree that you work out what God says to that degree he pours in. To the degree that you stop working out what he says, to, at that point, he stops pouring in. The more you work it out, the more he pours it in. Which means 
you can limit God by saying, I'm only willing to go this far and no further. And so, here's my point. Behind every act of obedience is more of Jesus. And so, if you want more of Jesus, you have to give him more obedience. One man was praying and saying, Lord, I want more of you. And the Lord responded by saying, you can have more of me when I've got more of you. Look at somebody and say, you can have more of Jesus. When Jesus has more of you. And so I think it's very, very important that we really try to um, practice obedience. Now I know this is very simple. And there's nothing deep about it. <laughs> but the key to walking with Jesus is simple obedience. Amen. Amen. And you know, if the truth be told, some of us really struggle with that. <laughs> to say, what if I was to say, you know the Holy Spirit tells you to get up in the morning earlier and pray? Come on now. And instead of getting up and praying like the Holy Spirit told you to, you push new. Amen. And miss your appointment with the Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Father. Yes, amen. Oh, I'm in the word of knowledge Come right on now. now. I didn't intend to say that. <laughs> oh, I did not. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is reminding you, get back. You know, I remember. <laughs> uh, what if? What if? What if? You know, you can look at it this way. You're missing God. But what if? It, it also goes the other direction. And you push snooze, the Holy Spirit is missing you. So, you know, and sometimes, you know, I don't know if you've ever been this way. I can certainly admit to it. You know, sometimes you can be a little bit half hearted in your obedience. You know, I obey when I'm in the mood. <laughs> But if I'm not in the mood, I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, what's wrong with y'all? Why y'all acting like you? Like you don't know what I'm talking about. Look at somebody say, if the shoe fits, it's your shoe. Now, you know, I'm not always obedient to the Lord. What's wrong with y'all? Don't judge me. <laughs> Not that I care, but I really <laughs> But let's let's look at somebody said, let's get real about it. Let's get let's get real real about about it. it. Now I'm I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you. How many of you you really should get up earlier to pray? And you kind of been missing some of your appointments with God. Raise your hand. Look around the room, please. Look, please look around. Look around. See, so this is why the Holy Spirit is pouring it out. I'm sure it will. 
And so, it is great to have you here. Thank you guys for coming. So, um, yeah, you just find any seed. Any seed is a good seed. You know. So, um, listen, um, this is going to be kind of like a fireside chat. I just wish we had a little fire somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I know we get all churchy and everything, but sometimes we need to be a le less churchy and more family. Amen. Okay? Amen. And so, uh, you know, so here's what I, okay, I, I say this to people because I don't know if you've ever had this experience I have where the preacher was preaching the word and, and you made a note in somewhere in the beginning of the message that you needed to repent, but 45 minutes later, when it comes time for an altar call, you, you forget what you needed to repent about. <laughs> Does anybody else have that experience? Other than me? So here's what I would say. I would say that we should pause right now. All of us that have missed our morning of appointments with the Master yeah. Jesus, why don't we just take 30 or 60 seconds to repent right now? Well, well, hop to it. Come on. Let's do it. I praise you, Father. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Father. I praise you, Jesus. I praise your Holy Spirit. I praise you, God Almighty. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Now, here's here's where I'm coming from. See, um, come on in. Hey, my brother, how you doing, man? Bless you. Hey, little woman. Bless you. So, uh, buy the seat, create a seat, <laughs> sit on the floor. Uh, you know. There you go. Yeah, we got a seat over there. Yeah, yeah. Let's just get all the Oh, is it back there? I just didn't yeah. see it. It's on TV. Yeah, look at it. Oh, I got my fireside on video. Uh, <laughs> it's a fireside chat. So, um, <laughs> let me, okay, I'm going to go here because um, um, purpose is what you're born to do. That's the why. Passion is what you love to do. Gifting is what you're empowered to do. Mm -hmm. Keep making that statement over and over. Okay? So, um, the reason you need to get in a good body and a good fellowship, and you need to commit yourself to the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and to a body of believers, you know, and act right. Look at somebody say, act right. Yeah, act right. <laughs> and so that, so that the pastors and the leadership, if you act right, they can give you an opportunity to express your gift. Because, listen to me closely, if you go too long without expressing your gift, you feel depressed. Amen. Okay? I'll say it again. Mm -hmm. When your gift is not expressed, you feel depressed. Mm -hmm. But we got to be able to trust you. Mm -hmm. Look at somebody say, please act right. Look somebody else for heaven's sake. Say, look at say for heaven's sake. Please act right. Please act right. <laughs> So, here's, here's what happens. Um, your Ecclesiastics 3 says this. It says to everything there is a time, a season, and a purpose. Everybody say a time, a, time, a season, a, season, and a purpose. purpose. So here's what happens. The Lord gives you an instruction, and hopefully you obey. Okay, now listen to me carefully. Mm -hmm. A 
as long as you obey that old instruction, you'll be in that old season. And it may be a good season. But at a certain point, you will sense or feel that that season is coming to a shift. But you can't begin a new season until you get a new instruction. Amen. Look at somebody say, you got to have a new instruction to enter into a new season. To enter into a new season. Amen. Without the new instruction, you can't enter into a new season. So what happens is this, is sometimes it seems as if you have insomnia. But what it is, is the Lord is waking you up at night, mm -hmm. trying to get you to listen so he can give you a new instruction. Amen. So you can enter a new season. Amen. So you trying to go back to sleep when you really need to pray. So sometimes sleep disturbance is not the evil one. Amen. It's the holy one. Amen. Amen. Trying to help you work out a problem. Mm -hmm. For example, and I said this last night and I'm not going to go into it except I'm going to give you the five points real brief. Number one, in order to grow, you have to have a problem that you don't know how to solve. Number two, you have to have limited or no resources. This is when you know you got a problem. I say this is when your mama can't fix it. When your daddy can't fix it, when your education can't fix it, when your money can't fix it. Number three, you have to have a willingness to fail at first. Look at somebody say, fail forward. Fail forward. Number four, you need a creative idea. And we talked about how God is a creator, Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, spoke to himself and said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then we talked about how 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any person be in Christ, this person is a new creation. Old things are dead and passed away, all things will come new. And so, because... And we talked about how Genesis, uh, John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by him, and without Jesus, nothing was made, was made, and Jesus is in you, and you're in Jesus. Which means creativity is in you. Creativity is thinking new. Okay? So, um, and if I want to do a Hebrew aside, because the word image is the Hebrew word to slam, which means shadow. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the what? Shadow. What should the shadow do? The light shines on your shadow. Whatever you do, the shadow follows. So Luke 9, 23, whoever will choose to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and what? Follow me. Stay with me? Follow me now. The word likeness is the muth, and it means to resemble. So Jesus in John 5, 19 says, the son can do nothing from himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. So Jesus would simply shadow the father. Amen. He, is the, he was the image of the invisible God. And you're supposed to be the image of the invisible Jesus. That's right. That's right. And Jesus resembled the Father. Hebrews says he was the outshining. He was the coined expression of the Father's image and person. 
In other words, if somebody wanted to know what Jesus was like, they should look at you. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. And that's, of course, when you've reached a certain place of maturity. So, how many of you, now you need to hear me, have noticed your sleep being disturbed and then you sense you're supposed to be praying? Look around the room. So this is why I'm bringing this out. Amen. The Father wants to give you a new instruction to take you into a new season. Without the new instruction, you get stuck into an old season. Mm -hmm. Okay, here, listen to me. The anointing that carried you to in, in an old season over time will start to delete. And you need a new instruction that brings you a new anointing to carry you forward. Let me just stay on this. Yes. Whenever you begin to lose your appetite and the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you begin to feel the need to fast, it is to prepare you for the revelation that's going to give you the instruction to go into a new season. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to, listen, you know what I'm really doing? I will teach you and instruct you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. I'm trying to show you the signals of the Holy Spirit. You need an idea. Everybody say creative idea. Creative idea. I mentioned last night in Hebrews, not Hebrews, Isaiah 11, where it talks about the sevenfold spirit of God being upon Jesus. The spirit of the Lord, the anointing, the glory. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And we said in the Hebrew, the word wisdom there is creativity. And so it's thinking new. Innovation is doing something new. Everybody say creativity, creativity. is thinking new. Thinking Everybody new. say innovation yeah. is doing something new. And by the way, when you go back to the building of the temple of Moses, the Spirit of God filled certain men so that they could make the articles of the temple. And, and God said, I'm filling them with the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Because what spirit of wisdom and understanding does is it gives you a blueprint. Now listen, this stuff works in church, this stuff works in your personal life, this stuff works in your business. This stuff works in church and ministry. Look at somebody say, you need the blueprint. You need the blueprint. You need the plans. So there, everybody say, you have dreamers and you have doers. So number five is you have to have the courage to act on the creative thought. See, here's, okay, here's the thing. One of the things I've learned is this. What activates the supernatural? The right question. What activates the supernatural? The right question. So here's my question. What is new? What is next? And what is now? Everybody go, what is new? What is new? What is next? What is now? So your Isaiah, your 43, verse 18, 19 says, look. Behold, I will do a new thing. Stop paying attention to remote things. Stop um, focusing on recent things of the past. Look, I'm doing a new thing. See, if you don't look, you won't see it. Look somebody, tell somebody you have to look to see. I'm going to do a new thing. And then all of a sudden, once you look and you see it, now it will spring forth. So everybody say, what is new? What is, what is, new? What is next? What is, next? What, is now? what is now? Okay? So, um, how many of you lately have felt like you need to be doing some fasting? Please raise your hands. Okay, look around the room. He's trying to take you into something new. Okay. 
Now, for those of you that are wondering, you, you came here tonight, you wanted me to prophesy. I've been prophesying ever since I got up. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Because here's the thing. Um, see, I don't know how much I'm going to tell you. No, because it's strange. And I realize that it's strange. Are you okay? We're strange. Like strange. Yes. Yes. <laughs> We're strange too. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> but since you mentioned it, you know that there is this distinct possibility that that could be true. <laughs> so, um, so in 1989, I had this angel visit me at 4 o'clock in the morning, month of December. He was between 25 and 30, white, dark hair, very handsome. So my spirit leaves my body, and we go through the heavens. I'm not happy because it's really fast. And I was a Star Trek, and I really wanted to enjoy the star systems, but it was a blur. So anyway, we land in heaven, and, you know, Isaiah talked about this temple, and there was lightning, and he's the same as standing before me. And I know I have an appointment with God, because when you get into heaven, you know, you just no things. So... There's a door there, and it's closed, but it opens back for me. I go ahead and the angel walks through the door. I walk through the door, and I see the glory of God. And then, of course, I turn to my left, which would be the right of the Father, and there's Jesus. I meet Jesus face to face. And then there are witnesses there. And so, um, I began to learn well, I'm not going to tell you everything because I never tell everything. But I began to have interactions with angels. And so different kinds of angels. And so um, even when I teach, I'm teaching um, with angelic assistance. Amen. And usually he stands over here when there's a certain one. There are different ones, but. So, so I, I, like, for example, you say, how did you prepare for this service? I, I took a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I rested. Um, I get quiet. I mean, I can pray, I can pray. Once I, I want to cross over, I get quiet. And then I let my spirit begin to feel what's going on around me. And I wait for him. So when he comes, then he starts telling me what to say and what to do. So I preach. And then, um, this is interesting. I'll just mention this in passing if you want to understand angelic ministry a little more. What will happen is, is like when I was with Pastor Tony, when he's up there, the angel that's assigned over his life and ministry stands over the, over the church. And then as soon as he turns it over to me, that major angel stands aside and the angel, the primary angel that's going to work with me takes his place. And one of our other angels. Because the angels, okay, as a good soldier in their hardness, good soldier of Jesus Christ. So those of us who are in ministry, we are part of God's earthly army. Well, you also have the angels, which are part of the heavenly army. And they're going to cooperate with us mm. as we do the will of God. Yes. Okay. Does this make sense to oh, yeah. you? Yes. Okay. So, in my case, when I decide to open up to the Holy Spirit, and I begin to let my spirit sense, then when there's divine purpose, then one of the angels come. And so, um, and so I've been working with this angel for a long time, this particular one, uh, for a long time. And, you know, I, 
I've worked with different angels, so I can know what God's going to do in the service based upon the angels that come. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and so, you know, it's not my imagination. Um, I remember I was doing a service in Illinois, and a little girl saw the angel to my left. I remember um, doing a service in Texas, and another little girl saw the angel, and I remember doing a service in Iowa. But it was a healing service. And so the Lord was doing miracles. And this man walked in. He wasn't, a, I don't think he was a part of the church. He just walked in and he looked through the vegetable. That's, you know, the, the doors where you're in the sanctuary. And he froze. He just stood there. So in the service, everybody said, That's a gift. That's a gift. Come here. So I walked up to the guy and his eyes were big. I don't even think he knew the Lord. He said, Who was that see through man that was standing next to you? Mm-hmm. Well, so, um, different angels do different things. You see, I could really get strange, but I'm among strange people, so maybe I should. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, so, you know, you can have angelic help in your ministry. Here's the thing. Um, You know, okay, let me tell you a story. There, there was a man of God, and he was a seer, and he was seeing this angel for quite some time, one of his angels, and then he went a period of time where he didn't see the angel. And so once the angel reappears, he says, well, where are you then? And the angel said, well, just like you um, get physical rest for your physical body, and you lay down and you go to sleep, we angels, we go to heaven to be in the presence of the Father, and that's our rest and refreshment. Look at somebody said, there's a message in there for you. (laughs) So this guy actually says, well, I'm glad that while you were getting rest and refreshment, nothing bad happened to me. (laughs) And you know, sometimes we got attitude. (laughs) to which the angel replied I made sure that you were provided for see so here's the funny part in Psalm 91 it says he will give his angels plural a command concerning you and they'll keep you in all your ways here's my real point don't make your angel ask God for a vacation from you Can't you see the angel? Lord, please. I can't take this attitude anymore. Can I have a break? I need you, God Almighty. I know you love this one. I love this one too, but I need you right now, oh God. You know, this reminds me of a story. (sighs) So there was a church split, and there was a man of God he was trying to reconcile. So he had all the people over here that wanted peace, and all the people over here that wanted to fight. (laughs) And so this man, the Lord gives him discerning spirits, and he he sees the angels. And when he went over here, the angels would go over there. But when he walked over there, the angels stopped. And so finally he turned and said, well, how come you go over here, but you won't go over there? And one of the angels says, because those people over there don't give us an atmosphere we can breathe in. Wow. 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 Jesus. So the Bible says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And so you need to give the angels an atmosphere they can breathe in by being in harmony with your Heavenly Father and being at peace with each other. Angels are attracted to atmospheres on earth that are similar to atmospheres in heaven. So sometimes an angel can be assigned to you, but what you're watching on TV, mm, the angel's got to go to the other room. 
Somebody said that was a holy rabbit trail. That was a holy rabbit trail. Okay. So anyway, um, purpose is what you were born to do. Passion is what you love to do. And we want God to give you the passion of his heart for your life. And gifting is what you're empowered to do. Most of us, here's our issue. And if I can go here. Are you guys all right? Yeah. Okay, here's the thing. <laughs> Proverbs 29 and 18 says this. When there's no vision, people perish. Vision is foresight. It's where you're going. Everybody say vision. Vision. Is a revelation from God. It's a revelation from God. A word. It's where you're going. It's where you're going. It's where you're going. Okay. But you need, with vision, you need wisdom and insight. Everybody say, foresight. Foresight. Needs insight. Needs insight. Insight is wisdom. It is, it is administration. Write down vision and administration. Vision and administration. Administration or wisdom or insight knows the sequential steps to turn that revelation into a reality. Oh my God. Again? Yeah, foresight, which is vision or prophecy, is a word from the Lord. It's where you're going. Needs insight, wisdom, and administration. Because wisdom and administration, insight, tells you the sequence of steps that must be taken to cause that revelation to become a reality. So let's say you have a call of God into ministry. So one of two things has to happen. In the fellowship that you're in, the leadership has to build a platform for you, or with the permission of God and the leadership, you need to build up your own platform that fits with the call of God for, for your life and for the church and for the ministry. Let me give you an example of what I mean. When they discovered that there was oil in the ocean, somebody said, how do we mine the wealth? And somebody had wisdom and said, let's build a platform. When they built the platform, they could get the treasure out of the darkness. So every ministry must have a platform. For example, this is Angela's platform. She built this platform. She's responsible for this platform. What she did is she brought me into her platform so that I can minister to you. Okay? So back in the day, you had Johnny Carson. Okay? You had, you had these hosts at the night show, you know, Conan O'Brien or what's some of the other of these guys' names? Jay Leno. Jay Leno. Who, who else? More Jimmy recent. Kimmel. Huh? Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel. So, Kimmel. So what they did is you have a host and that, that show is the platform that invites on other guests. So that's what keeps the show new. That's the platform. Well, Sid, back in the day when he started, quote, It's Supernatural, he started out as the investigative reporter into the supernatural, and he had the same concept. He would have a TV show, and he would invite on guests. And that kept the show new. That became the platform. Because every ministry has to have a platform. So you platform your ministry based upon your calling. Okay, you should write that down. That was like really important. Mm -hmm. You platform your ministry based upon your gifting and your anointing. You platform your ministry based upon your God-given purpose. And to be honest with you, your platform must fit 
your personality. <laughs> So let me tell you what's going on. You can have a real call of God. You can have a real gift, a real anointing. You can have a real ministry, possibility. But unless you find the right platform, where you get the wisdom of God and you build the platform, your ministry will stall out. Oh, I'm taking the time. Because all of a sudden, light's coming into your eyes. Because you'll go, well, the Lord told me I was going to do this, that, and the other. Let me help you understand something. Okay, yeah, this is oversimplification. You have two types of prophets. You have unconditional prophecy, whether you believe it or not, it's going to come to pass. Jesus is coming back, whether you believe it or not. Right? But personal prophecy, by its nature, is conditional. That prophetic word may not necessarily happen. It's a potential and a possibility based upon your faith, your obedience, and your patience. Just because it's said by God don't mean it's going to happen. Most prophetic words are in the area of foresight, which means you got to turn around and seek the Lord for insight and the sequence of steps you have to take for that prophetic word to come to pass. Mm -hmm. And so then you go, that must not have been a real word. So you're waiting around for God just to do it. When he's trying to give you a creative idea. Mm -hmm. And the courage to act. Amen. Because James 1 and 22 says, be ye doers of the word, but the Greek word for doers is poetics, which is creativity. So then people go, well, hmm. That must not have been a real word, word, because if it was a real word, it would come to pass. But what you doing with it? Because somebody said you got to do something. You got to do, got something. To do something. I'm gonna take my time. Oh, thank you, Lord. Because you have your part, and then God has His. Mm -hmm. And if you don't act, He's not gonna act. You got to move for God to move. You waiting for God to move. He waiting for you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that sounds like pretty good preaching. Well, Very good preaching. Well, let's just see if, let's, let's see if it's biblical. Thank you, Lord. So turn to Mark 16. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Sixteen. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they may come and anoint Jesus. Very early in the morning, first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. They said, well, who's going to roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? When they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away. It was very great. Upon entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were scared. I guess so. <laughs> And he says to them, don't be afraid. You seek Jesus, the Nazarene, was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples and, and Peter that Jesus goes before you into Galilee, and there you'll see him. They went out quick and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled, were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Mm. Now, when Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast several uh, seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him, that the disciples, and as they mourned and wept, and they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen or heard, they didn't believe. Mm. And after that, he appeared in another form to two of them, and they, they walked and went into the country, and as they went and told it to the residue, they didn't believe them. Mm. And afterward, he appeared to the eleven as they sat in food and, 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 and upbraided them with, for their unbelief and hardness of heart. 
Because they didn't believe they would have seen him after he was risen. Mm. Let me help you. There's a scripture that says this. The Lord gave the word, Old Testament scripture. And great was the company of them that published it. That's English. What is it? Somebody quoted it? Psalm 16. What is it? Psalm 68. Verse 11. But did you know in the Hebrew it said, the Lord gave the word and great was the company of women who published it. In the Old Covenant, you had men shepherds and women shepherds. Mm. What's up? Jesus is appearing to the women first. Come on. Mm. And when the women tell the men Jesus is alive, the men don't believe him because why should you believe a woman? And then Jesus comes and rebukes the 11 <laughs> disciples because they didn't believe the women. Mm -hmm. I wonder now. if Jesus is making a point <laughs> about women. Yes. Paul comes along later and says, hmm. There's neither male nor female nor bond or free, Jew or Gentile, all are one in Christ Jesus. Well, what about when he says, I don't suffer a woman to speak in church? Well, context determines meaning. Back in those days, the women sat over here, the brothers sat over here, and the teachers teaching, and the women would interrupt the teacher and go, hey, honey, George, what's he talking about? <laughs> That's the context. That's right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I don't suffer a woman to teach her. You suffer authority over a man. This is what Paul is saying. He says, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. But what's he battling? He's battling a doctrine from Diane of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. Not an issue concerning women in ministry. Mm -hmm. Because in the scriptures, he mentions Priscilla mm -hmm. and Aquila and mentions her first the majority of the time. And for those of you that are Bible scholars, let me really mess with you. <laughs> You can do with this whatever you want to do with it. There is a scholarly debate about who wrote the book of Hebrews. And there's three names that pop up. Guess who the three are? Paul, Apollos, and Priscilla. Wait, let me mess with you. I'm reading for King James Version. But if I go to the Greek text for the first 300 years, where Paul says in Acts 16, salute Junia and Andronicus, which are of note, apostles before me, the Mackin folk. Until 300 AD, it was not Junia, it was Julius, which is a woman's name. <laughs> That's the text. Yes. So what you gonna do with the text? That's the text. And sometimes we men, we don't, we insecure. <laughs> because you think it's about a man or a woman. But if you go to the text in Ephesians 4 and turn them to Ephesians. You know. <sighs> Ephesians, Ephesians 4 and 7. I'm gonna mess with you because you came. You may you may wish you had to come. <laughs> but Ephesians 4 and 7 says this, but to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Mm -hmm. This word gift here is not charismata, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it is the Greek word doma, because it's a gift of Christ. It means that Christ is the gift in the person. So when it says here in um, verse verse eight, wherefore it says Jesus ascended on high and left cap captivity cap captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And in verse eleven, he gave some apostles, some prophets, and in the Greek it means indeed or in reality, evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. It ain't Jesus. Listen, is Jesus in the man? That's the gift. Is Jesus in the woman? Look at somebody say, quit looking at the gender. 
Looking at, and look at Jesus in the person. And look at Jesus in the person. I mean, you know, you gotta you gotta look at you gotta look at Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Mm -hmm. She was a prophet. She was a leader. Mm -hmm. You gotta look at Deborah. She was a leader. Right. You gotta look at Hoda. She was a leader. So you're looking at judges and prophetesses. You know, and you got to look at some of the statements that Paul says about women. People take that one statement, pull it out of context, mm -hmm. and they turn it into a doctrine because, but here's the problem. Theologically, <laughs> no word is established unless there are two or three witnesses. Exactly. And you don't have any more witnesses on that because it was a cultural statement, right. not a doctrinal practice statement. That's right. That's right. Okay? So, now don't mess with me in theology. Because that's what my first degree was in. And don't let the way I talk fool you. I'm, I'm really educated. <laughs> I really am. Don't let the way I talk fool you. Because you'll start talking, and I'll go, mm-hmm, but the Hebrew says, and the Greek says, and then if you want to go further, we go into the Aramaic. So don't 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 come with no mess. Okay. Come on. Now Papa's talking now. You can tell. Papa's talking. To totally different tone. So don't go, don't, don't go there with theology. I went to Bible college. Okay? You know. And so it's like, okay, you're going to say that, but this is the text. And so, um, I say, I'm not crazy. Because, see, I know that in some cases, people change the text. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because it didn't fit what they believed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, very true. That's right. Yeah. So, it's okay. So that's why, this is why you have to compare texts. Greek text. I'm going to leave that alone. Look at somebody and say, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you know where I stand. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so I have a full-grown Jesus living on the inside of me. Amen. 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 Okay. So, um, so if you can't handle no a woman pastor, you, are you revealing that you got issues with women? That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna let that woman tell me what to do. But, but what if she's saying the word of the Lord? It ain't her telling you what to do, it's Jesus. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. No, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> But no, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting this. I'm, I'm cutting this. I'm cutting it now because, um, you know, it's not about it's not about gender. It's about is it the word of the Lord? You know. So. Mm. <laughs> And so there's a reason why many times um, you have men and women in pastoral ministry because there's some stuff that women can handle better than men and there's other stuff that men can handle better than women mm -hmm. and we need, and so you got to think of that. This, everybody say, this is the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. So, you know, we got to have some balance. Everybody say, some balance. Balance. <laughs> so... Um, and by the way, don't 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 quote to me. Don't quote to me. First and Second Timothy and Titus about elders being men, because elders, fivefold yeah. ministry goes beyond elders. Yeah, that's right. Go to the Greek text. Mm -hmm. Fivefold ministry also elders, mm -hmm. but it goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave you alone. <laughs> 
And the reason why I say it goes beyond it is because if you look at the Greek qualifications of an elder, their personal qualifications, their marital, quali mar marital qualifications, their father and mother qualifications, and their communi community qualifications, and the only gift that an elder has to have is teach. Mm -hmm. It's only one. Well, you got to do more than that if you're an evangelist. You got to do more than that if you're an apostle. You got to do more than that if you're a prophet. So it has to be beyond just what we're looking at. Look at somebody say, rightly divide the word. Rightly divide the word. Right. 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 And elders can come and go. I'm going to leave you alone. <laughs> ah, so you had your doctrinal, your doctrinal class. <laughs> what time did I start? What time is it now? 8.50. So I've been going an hour. I'll go a little while longer. Purpose is what you were born to do. Passion is what you love to do. Gifting is what you're empowered to do. The issue is the platform. Okay? I'm telling you. What is the platform? What are the platforms? This is, this is going to answer why things are not moving. And if you go back, like I said, okay, let me take you back to your, to your, to your mark, to your, to your mark um, 16. I know I'm bouncing. Please forgive me. But I said that you have to do for Jesus to do. So in Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus says, You go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So you go into the cosmos and you carex, preach as carex, and a carex is caruso, but it's from the word carex. A carex was an official representative of the king. So let's say a king had a message for a person or for a people, he would call in the carex. When the carex would come into the presence of the king, he would look at the king to see the mood of the king, the attitude of the king, the heart of the king. He would always come with a writing instrument. He would sit down, and he would take write down the message of the king. He would not add to it or take away from it. He would write it down exactly, and he would listen to how the king develops the message, how he speaks the message, the mood, his temperament. Is he angry? Is he sad? Is he happy? Is he joyful? And then when he goes to deliver that message... He does it exactly like he saw it in the presence of the king. Look at somebody say, ministry, ministry begins in the presence of the king. Ministry begins in the presence of the king. And the carrots, by nature, had to have an exemplary life because everything he thought, said, and did, both privately and publicly, reflected upon the king. Look at somebody say, the Holy Spirit's talking to you. And by the way, the presence and the glory are not the same thing. The Hebrew word for presence is panim. There are seven different words for glory. When you're dealing with kavod or, or kavod, it is the invisible glory. When you're dealing with the shakanah, which we call the shakanah, it is the visible glory. And there are seven different words for glory. Presence has to do with being face to face with God. If I say presence, presence is face to face with God. It's face -to -face with God. The Lord moved, talked to Moses like a man talks to his friend face to face. But that was not Moses' request. And when, when Moses gets started, God says, My presence will go with you. Later in Exodus 33 and 34, Moses has a different request. He says, show me your glory. So God says, you can't see my face. Because the face doesn't reveal the glory. He said, you'll see my hinder parts. Okay. Okay. The, fa okay. the face is the presence. It's the front side of God. The glory is the back side of God. It's his story. It's history. So when Moses does his 40, 80 days of fasting, what does he write? He writes God's history, which reveals his glory. Mm -hmm. Jesus. In the beginning, God. 
So when you release his story, it manifests his glory. So you're asking for the backside of God when he's passed by, when you need to start with the presence. Look at somebody and say, you start with the presence. And then you go for the glory. Now I'm going to answer another question while I'm here because the Holy Spirit, you know, he told me, told me quite a while ago, but I'm just not getting to it because I'm, I move slow. But I'm going to answer a question. See, here's what most people are doing. Too many people, Pentecostal people. You trying to feel the woo woo. Mm -hmm. The glory coming on you. That's what you're trying to do. But Colossians 1 27 says, Christ in you, the hope of what? Glory. Christ in you. So you focus on the inner glory because you obey his story. You keep his word and his commandments. Jesus said, Abide in me and I will abide in you. So where you focus in terms of presence and glory is the inner glory. Everybody say the inner glory. The inner glory. Everybody say it's the abiding presence. When you're face to face with God, hearing and obeying. And it's the, it is the inner glory. It's the abiding glory. Because some of y'all right now, you're frustrated because you're going, when you're not in the church service, you by yourself praying, and you say, where is the presence of the Lord? Come on, how many of y'all been doing it? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Sometimes. High, lift them up. Sometimes you've been doing it. Raise them high, unless you got a shoulder condition. Look around the room. No, seriously. This is where you want to go. Right here. So you sense the presence of the Lord within you. Usually that takes the form of peace. That the peace of God, guard, keep, and empower your mind and heart in Christ Jesus. What's an arm power do? You either struck out, mm -hmm. it's a foul ball, it's in play, or it's a home run. Mm -hmm. What you're trying to get to is the overshadowing glory. Your Acts 5.15, <clears throat> where God gets in Peter's shadow and it heals the sick. Look at somebody and say, pay attention to the inner glory. And eventually you'll experience the overshadowing glory. Many times when you need divine protection, that's when you also have the overshadowing glory. He that abides in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. Hello. And then it talks about the protections and the benefits and the prosperity. Does that make sense, Steve? It's very, very important. Because, see, otherwise you'll think, I, I, I want to feel this anointing and this glory, but you're not feeling it. And you're thinking, well, what's wrong with me? Why can't I? Look at somebody say, ain't nothing wrong with you. Ain't nothing wrong with you. Ain't nothing wrong with you. You know. So, anyway. Okay. Um, let's see. I, you said I started at 7.50? Okay, so I've gone 68 minutes. I'll take a couple other minutes and then I'll share. How many of you getting something out of this? Amen. Okay. Um, some of the greatest miracles I have participated in with Jesus, when they were happening, I felt absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen some marvelous miracles. <laughs> I teach a class on how to raise the dead. You know that there are systems for raising the dead to life? Yeah, I know, right? I'm not teaching that class tonight. <laughs> but I've seen Jesus raise the dead more than a few times. And I didn't feel a thing when it was happening. Don't need to. All I need is to hear the voice or to be led by the Spirit. Amen. That's all I need to do. I don't need to feel a thing. Why? Ain't nothing wrong with feeling. <clears throat> but we walk by faith and not by what? Sorry. But now you can also be led by the Spirit in a feeling inside of your heart by the Holy Ghost. And that's legitimate as the voice or the vision. 
That makes sense. Yes. Okay. You've been sitting long enough. You should stand to your feet and stretch. Some of y'all kind of old. Even some of you young people need to stretch. <laughs> Stretch yourself. Stretch yourself. Now let's take about three or four minutes and let's praise the Lord. Go ahead. In tongues. Go ahead. tell you my personal approach to prophecy. I do not wear the robe of infallibility. I tell people that my prophetic ministry is 50% either I'm right or I'm wrong. I really mean that. Because here's the thing I have learned by experience is that you can have a conversation with a person and they can say something to you and if it's a um, you know, as, as some of you can hear a person accurately, but sometimes they're talking to you and you heard them, but you didn't hear them accurately. Mm -hmm. If this can happen between two human beings, it can certainly happen between you and the Spirit of the Lord, where you don't hear the Lord accurately. You thought he said this, but he actually said that. And that can happen. Next, the Bible says, uh, do not despise prophecy, but hold fast to that which is good. Meaning, there's going to be some some stuff that ain't so good. Look at somebody say, eat the meat and spit out the bones. Eat the meat and spit out the bones. Okay, and there are, pro there are prophecies that are, um, you know, prophecy being, this is what God is saying. Forth telling versus foretelling. And sometimes, somebody can give you a prophecy and you can go, I don't believe that. <laughs> and then, you know, a year later it could come to pass. Right. <laughs> and, you know, um, depending upon what kind of prophecy it is. And um, typically what I do is I enter either through discerning the spiritual word of knowledge and I talk to you about the present or the past before I go and talk to you about the future. And I rarely say this is what the Lord says. You know, I mean, if it's the word of the Lord, you'll figure it out. Uh, plus, I could always be wrong. Look at somebody saying, and you can too. 
Okay? And so sometimes I have very interesting experiences. Like I remember I was ministering to this woman. And I said, who's Ann? She said, I don't know no Ann. I said, who's Anna? Oh, that's my daughter. <laughs> no, because what happens is, is sometimes when you're talking to a person, they have a brain freeze. Right? They have a brain freeze. And so, uh, and so they just can't think. I remember I ministered to one woman. I said, who's Jeff? I don't know no Jeff. She had a she had a transcemic attack. She just had memory loss. Well, later on, she tells me Jeff was she was a minister. Jeff was the man who ordained me. But she just her brain just went into pause. And look at somebody saying and that's okay. And that's okay. And so sometimes, like 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 when you're giving names, it's not really the name; it's the symbol of what the name represents. Does that make sense to you? Oh, yeah. And so sometimes when you're having a revelation, it's literal. Sometimes it's symbolic. You know, um, you know, you know. You you you, you got you got uh, seven skinny cows eating seven fat cows. Okay, that's that's a symbolic revelation. Okay? So it's it's um, what do the symbols represent? And so sometimes when a symbolic revelation, you have the revelation itself, you have the interpretation, you have the application. And so sometimes you can miss it in the area of the interpretation. Example, this is a true example. Um, one prophetic minister was ministering, and he's, he says to this guy, he sees this guy's head in the clouds, and he sees money, and he says to the guy, you're mismanaging your money, and the guy says, no, I'm not. And so they did a real good thing, they took it to the pastor. And the pastor had a different interpretation of your heads in the clouds. Typically, heads in the clouds as a symbol means you don't know what's going on, <clears throat> right? Well, this guy had actually been in business. He had a business partner, and his business partner was still in the money. So his head was in the clouds, and there was money, but he didn't know that he was being stolen from. And so they had a pastor that helped to give the right interpretation to bring the right application. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So... Um, So let's just start here. So this sister right here, I'm pointing at you, and you're looking at me, and now you're doing like this, so yeah, I'm talking to you. Me? Yeah, you. <laughs> so um, let me start with this. Um, does the name Anna or Anne, Anna or Anne or like Angie or anything, Angela, does that have a meaning for you? And who is that? It is your daughter-in-law. Um, and the reason I do it that way is because my real name is Philip Anthony. So, you know, Anthony, it could be Antonio, it could be Tony, it could be Felipe, you know what I mean? Felipe, I mean, you know, just, so what you do is you do derivatives of the name. So what do they usually call your daughter-in-law? Anna or Sonida. Huh? Anna or Sonida. Sonida is what? I only, speak, I only speak English partially. <laughs> it's a middle name, but they call her Anna. Okay, so that's your daughter-in-law. Okay, so I want you to tell me what is significant in your life or the life of your family about the month of June. Both of her birthdays. Both of whose birthdays? Mine Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm confused. So, for whatever reason, I'm in the middle of January, uh, in the middle of June right about now. So, tell me about the middle of June. You know, like 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, in that area. Birthday is the 15th. Yeah. And 19th and 24th. Yeah, because I also felt the end. So now, so, now you have confidence from the two things I just told you that are past tense and present. That maybe what I might say next might be coming from God, hey? Eh? Yes? Right? Because I went into the middle of June, right? And we started with your daughter-in-law, right? So we, we, we hit the numbers, right? Okay. So um, are you aware, notice how I do this, 
Are you aware that your patience is being tested? You are in a season of spiritual development. Mm. It is not that the Lord is not hearing you. He's hearing you. But you're being stretched. So the, the thing I want to say to you is he's hearing you. And you're being stretched. You're being matured. Okay? Yeah, we're going to need some Kleenex. I, I have this thing, uh, I make people cry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, <sighs> so, I need to give you a number of different scriptures because of what I saw before I got up. So, I need to give you James 1. Yeah, she'll, she'll transcribe. Um, you know where it says, count it all joy, not if you fall into different temptations, but when you fall into different temptations, knowing this, the trying of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its full effect, that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So right now, um, you need to let patience have its full effect, because the Lord is in the process of maturing you. He's doing something in you. Later, he will do something for you. I know you're lifting up your family before the Lord. I know about the man. And I know about the burden that's being carried with regards to this man. And I know you've been praying about this man. You need to know that the Lord is hearing you. You've been praying about this man. But then there's two men. There's one older and there's one younger. Isn't that correct? I know. I like to do this for a living. I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> <laughs> know that song where it says, even though I can't see it, he's working? He's working. And there will be a successful resolution and conclusion in the lives of these two males because of your prayers. But in the meanwhile, you just have to be patient. Because you know we men sometimes be a little slow. <laughs> Women change because they want to. Many times men don't change until they have to. And so the Lord has got a way of dealing with a male and put him in a position where he feels like he has no choice but to change. And then he'll go, mm, yes. <laughs> so your prayers are putting pressure Right? Until somebody bends the knee and says, yes, Lord Jesus. Are you able to relate to that? Is that the word of the Lord? You feel better now? Good. See you later. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Lift up your hands and let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, let me let me go with my sister right here because I'm going to deal with this role. Yes, you, woman, you.
Yeah. So one of the angels <laughs> that has to work with me, you should pity him and pray for him. He has a sense of humor. He has to. He's got to deal with me. <laughs> so no, so I'm in. I'm, I'll never forget this. I was in. Where was I at? I was in Tennessee. I was in Lebanon, Tennessee, and I was doing this meeting. And this woman, her name was Lorna, she was a nurse, and God opened her eyes, and she says, I saw your angel. And I said, you saw the one that was working with me that night. Mm -hmm. and, and, she, and I said, did you talk to him? She said, can I? I said, yeah, he's real now. <laughs> so the next meeting, God opens up her eyes, and she sees the angel. He looks at her, smiling. <laughs> <laughs> he's the real personality. Yeah, he's real. So now she's really encouraged. So she goes, um, what's your name? He looks at her and says, you don't need to know my name. <laughs> you just need to know Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this one, you know, he, uh, he's, he's got a sense of humor. He's got to. Um, you'd, be su you'd be surprised at how sometimes the angels that work with you, um, they, they can sometimes fit um, different aspects of your personality. Yeah. So the angel that's working with you, um, so if you, like, so when I'm, so when I'm in this other zone, because I do have this other zone I can be in that's extremely authoritative, I may have a different kind of angel working with me, and he ain't smiling. Okay? So, <laughs> anyway, so can I talk to you? Good, good. You know, um, some people are really good at giving, but they need to improve their ability to receive. You know anybody like that sitting on the second row here tonight? <laughs> what are you looking at her for? What's she got to do with this conversation? You know this one? Is she is she good at giving? Does she is she a little struggle a little bit with receiving? She kind of like need to work on that or something? <laughs> Oh, I do funny prophecy sometimes. Mm. I rebuke people with humor. <laughs> okay? The reason why I do that is because you can land hard on somebody or you can have a soft landing. Because I'm so fluffy, I like to land real soft <laughs> <on me. laughs> But what it is is this. See, um, you have a Romans 12 gift of teach, uh, a Romans 12 gift of giving. So because Jesus manifests himself in you as a giver and uh, you learn how to give early in life, um, it comes easy for you, you know, because you're like a caretaker and you want to take care of everybody and get everybody fixed and <laughs> you put yourself last and, you know, you, you need it. <laughs> put your arm around it. Give her. Put your arm around it right now, because we're going to be We're going to be So let me talk to you. Because you need help. Um, I'm going to give you scripture. Oh, I know you probably never seen prophecy this way, but look at somebody say, at least it's not boring. At least it's not boring. I believe if you should prophesy, you ought to at least have some style and some finesse with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All right. So, so anyway, so this is true. So um, in First Timothy, the church is about a hundred thousand people in Ephesus, and the bishop of the church is Timothy. The heir is about two hundred fifty uh, thousand people. So they, you know, the church is huge, and, and Timothy is very busy. And in chapter 1, Paul begins to say, Take heed to yourself and to your doctrine, and in so doing you will save yourself and others. But in the Greek, it means this. Take heed to yourself means to get a hold of yourself. What the message is in the Greek is this. Timothy was so busy taking care of everything else and everybody else, he was losing himself. Amen. And the Holy Spirit was saying to Timothy, Take care of yourself first, so then you can take care of others. Because if you take care of all these other people and not take care of yourself, you're going to shorten your ministry. So it's like a course correction for you. But I will say this, you're in good company with Timothy. <laughs> Catch 
your breath. Go. Ooh. Ooh. But you're great at serving. And you're great at giving because you have a gift, a tw Romans 12 gift of serving. You're great at that. Okay, you just need to get in balance. Because see, can I, do I have permission to go further? I'm glad you gave me permission. Because you know how people can get on your nerves because they ask you to do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you get, you do it for me, you get mad at them, like, leave me alone, but I'm still going to do it for you. Take another breath. <laughs> but this compassion that you have and this caring that you have is beautiful. The Lord Jesus loves it. But see, what can happen is it's because you're so good at giving but not so good at receiving. You get frustrated because you can say, well, I wish other people would care about me the way I care about them. I believe you had this conversation with yourself. Talk to me. I know you have because I am all up in your business. <laughs> Here's the good thing. While I'm prophesying to you, I'm prophesying to a number of other people. And they're, yes. and they're going, boy, I'm glad he's calling her. <laughs> go, Ooh, that's a word for the Lord. That's for me. But I'm glad he's telling her. I'm going to skate right on past and make my correction. <laughs> that's the beautiful thing about prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul said you can all prophesy and learn. So they're it isn't just for edification and comfort and exhortation or even correction or rebuke or whatever. It's also for learning. It teaches. Now, just to give you some comfort, how many other women in this room can relate to this prophetic word? Raise your hands. Please please get up and look around. Keep your hands up. Yeah. Keep, you get up and look around the room. <laughs> look around the room. Yeah. Look around the room. All the hands of this prophecy fits. Amen. Look at somebody and say, that's your word from the Lord. Word from the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Okay? Now listen, just like you go to a physician, and you want a physician who has a good bedside manner, even there's prophetic etiquette. Everybody say prophetic etiquette. Prophetic etiquette. Okay? See, so she has an admirable trait. Okay? But now the Holy Spirit wants you to learn how to. And this is something you need to pray through. You need to pray through asking the Lord to help you to receive just as skillfully and just as easily as you are able to give. And, you know, some people... They're like uh, Tabitha or Dorcas, and they cook for people, they clean for people, they give people rides, they assist people. You know anybody like this, right? <laughs> anybody know this woman? Are we describing her? Yes. And, 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 and listen, this was so, this so, what Dorcas, now you need to hear this because I'm, I'm, I'm really going to get in your business. The father loved what Dorcas and Tabitha did so much, he put her in the Bible. That's how much it was esteemed by God. But your issue is, you have devalued the worth of your giving and your service. And I'm just rebuking you. Listen, look at me, look at me. <laughs> yeah, I just <laughs> because you've made it insignificant. So what has happened is is this is an attack of the devil to rob you of the significance of the grace that's in your life that's so precious, so beautiful in the sight of God. And that's and that's not even that's not even how you've been discounted by men. Mm. Oh, yes, I am going to do that. Because, oh, I know. Look at me. 
Kennedy. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is blowing her kisses. So you have God's love and acceptance. Okay? Some people don't know what they're looking at. So they can't appreciate it. So we just have to forgive the ignorance. Because a person doesn't know what they don't know. By the way, that was John Maxwell. Just so you know. Just so you know, I'm a little well read. <laughs> I just put it in a little different context. Okay? So right now, you notice how your heart's being healed. Right? And this burden and this weight is lifting off of you. This is called deliverance. Yeah. <laughs> So you don't always have to say in the name of Jesus, you devil, come out. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when the devil is exposed, it departs and it changes the experience of your soul. So you're being healed and delivered right now. Because if they just don't know, they don't know. So the Lord is going to position you where some people are going to be able to discern who you really are in the spirit. You know, and appreciate you. But you need to appreciate yourself more. Mm. Oh, wrap your arm around her right now. <laughs> now you may say, why do you take time with people? Because Jesus takes time. That's right. Now you know, you, you realize when you're doing a service, you can't minister to everybody. But you minister to who you can in the time that you have. Okay, so um, the brother right here and the woman next. Who, who are you, woman? I'm Stephanie. And who are you? Tony. Tony, you got a great name. <laughs> so um, if I was to say the name Steve or the name Stephen, who would come to mind? Huh? My stepdad? Yes. Okay, so this is a sign to you about what I'm going to say next. Okay, there's a Stephen in the Bible, right? He was a deacon. He was a servant of God and a servant to the people. But there was something about this Stephen. He was full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. He was also full of wisdom. And he also did great signs and wonders among the people. You're interested in signs and wonders, aren't you? Yeah, sort of, right? I know he's all about, he's all about the signs of the waters. <laughs> okay, so in Acts six and eight it says that Stephen did great signs and wonders, and really when you're looking at it, um, Terrace, it's it's the miraculous. So have you been praying about miracles? You've been praying about signs and wonders. Okay, when I looked at you, I, I said I saw Stephen. I, yeah, so it had a double meaning. Stephen is your what? Your father and stepfather, and so. Uh, but it's also related to this. So the Father is going to give you, God the Father is going to give you as a gift. He's going to deposit in you faith, wisdom, and there's going to be an enlargement of your heart. Okay? In terms of the fullness of the Spirit, where he's going to show you how to do signs, wonders, and miracles. Amen. The Holy Spirit is going to give you a course in the miraculous. Okay, so now I have to advise you. Because that's, that's the word of knowledge and that's the prophecy part. Now I'm going to give you the word of wisdom part. Okay. Um, have you ever heard of a man by the name of Charles Capps? Have you? Okay. You can go online and Charles Capps wrote a book called The Tongue of Creative Force. A tongue, the creative force. You need to read the book. Yeah, I'll take the time. Charles Capps, C A P P S, The Tongue, a Creative Force. Okay? And his basic premise is this from your Mark 11, you know, who service will say this now? But he talks about the Word of God formed. The word of God conceived in your heart, formed by your tongue, 
Spoken out of your mouth releases God's creative power through you. Everybody say creative power. Creative power. power. Okay, so you need to read that and you need to study that. Number two. You've heard of A.A. A. Allen. You've heard of A.A. A. Allen. Okay, so you want to go online and you want to read a book called um, um, The Price for God's Miracle Working Power. Mm -hmm. It's online, A.A. A. Allen. Now, I know, I know Robert's learned. I know. We've done ministry together. And Robert's will say, that A.A. A. Allen had a drinking problem. R.W. Schoenbach disagreed with that. And the guy who did the autopsy later on said he was paid to say that Allen had a drinking problem. Allen did not have a drinking problem. What he had was is he had a problem with his knee. And so what he did is, is he, would, he, he actually walked with a limp, but in the meetings he would stand up straight and it would aggravate his knee. And so he took prescription pills. And sometimes he would take too many. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to kill this pain. Follow what I'm saying? Okay. So, but, he, but, but the devil has tried to, you know, make him less than what he was. And I'm not saying that A. Allen didn't have issues. Trust me, he did have some issues. Okay. But you can go online on YouTube and watch A.A. A. Allen. You want to listen to some of his messages, but you want to watch him minister to the sick. And you're going to pay attention to how he, how he listened to God. That's why he was called the miracle man. How he listened to God on how to work the miracle. You're going to learn some things from watching A.A. A. Allen. Number three. I'm going to have you watch a guy named John Meller. M -E you haven't heard of him. He's from Australia. John Meller. M-E-L-L-O-R. And you just want to watch him minister to the sick. You pay attention to how he gets people up out of wheelchairs and other conditions. Because he was known in Australia. He even made national news about some of the miracles. Ah, pff, I never listened to him preach. Ah, you know, maybe he can. I'm a, uh, um, I'm hard to impress when it comes to preaching. You actually have to say something. I'm done. <laughs> Who said I'm done? <laughs> you actually have to say something because I'm very revelatory. But he's great as an evangelist and as a, as a healing miracle minister. I mean, he is phenomenal. Okay. So, um, and then the classic. What the classic is, I really think you should read some Kenneth Hagin. Okay, you should read some Kenneth Hagin. Because, you know, you just, I mean, you know, you should just read Kenneth Hagin. All right? And so that's, that's what I'm going to say to you. So I'm done. It was great talking to you. I have to move on now. Lift up your hands and let's praise the Lord. Oh, and Stephanie, um, I, yeah, come, yeah, just, yeah. Okay, listen, so are you going to minister to the women or what are you going to do? That's my jam. That's your jam, right? So listen to me, listen. So the spirit of counsel, the spirit of counsel is going to be on me because I see you counseling women. You, you already been doing this, right? Yeah. And so a lot of this has to do with inner healing, right? 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 And deliverance. Right? And just helping people like in marriage and raising their kids and practical stuff in life. Right? Okay. So I'm seeing Joyce Meyer. So tell me about you and Joyce Meyer. That was the first person he started listening to when we started getting fired up. That and Sid Roth. So. Yeah. And by the way, she's a Christian marriage and family therapist. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty good at this. Yeah. yeah, I'm really, really pretty good at this. Yeah, yeah. I, I really don't let don't let me fool you. You know what I mean? I, I really, I really know what I'm doing, even though I act like I'm confused. And sometimes I really am. So, so anyway, um, 
So, but I see Joyce Meyer, but then I see, looks like Beth White? More? Beth, Beth, Beth Moore. Beth Moore. Yeah. yeah, Insecurity No More or No More Insecurity, something like that. Have you read that book? No, but she's like, why well, I fell in love with scripture. Yeah, so read her book, like Insecurity No More or No More Insecurity. Um, you need to read Joyce Meyer, Beauty Out of Ashes. Have you read that book? And you need to read Battlefield of the Mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You got that one? Yeah. Okay, because, um, oh, and you need to read My Dear Friend. You need to watch My Dear Friend, Katie Souza. Yeah, I like her a lot. Oh, she's got a pop. Yeah, she is. Yeah. She's amazing. And your other girl, Maya Warner. No, that's my daughter. Yeah, that's true. I've been mentoring her things as well. Yeah, you know, she, did she, you ever heard her talk about us meeting in heaven? Yeah, that's why we came. Okay, yeah, she's my daughter. You're hoping you're going to say you'll see us today. <laughs> That's a whole other subject. <laughs> yeah, you know. Remember we talked about uh, where we talked about by location? Yeah, yeah. That's a whole other subject. So um, yeah, matter of fact, she she and I have been doing that. I have to I send a thing in there for her school, but I, I have to speak to her school, I think Thursday night. And then we'll be doing a meeting together in Eugene, Oregon. For a pastor, Brad Nieswinder, who's like an expert in the area of deliverance. And I mean real deliverance. Like, um, <laughs> so he's ministering to this little woman, and she shape shifts and she becomes a cat. And he turns to Jenny, his wife, and says, Did you see that? She said, Yeah, I did. And so, um, his minister to another man, and the man shape shifted, and his head became a bore. So he's like really good at deliverance. See, what used to be in Africa and Haiti and other places, it's here in the United States now. Okay, so he's like really good at that, huh? Oh, it's here. So, yeah, I'm, uh, don't don't get because I'll get off on all of that, and I don't need to. I need to. Say. Huh? What? <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 don't get me started, because I can go down that road, I don't need to, I need to try to stay on pass. I don't, I don't, I don't want to have any uh, ministry attention deficit, you know what I mean? So, anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, are you watch Katie Souza? You take any notes? Good, because that's going to also benefit you. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I need to get together with Katie. We need to start doing some stuff. You know, we, we did some videos together. You knew that, right? Yeah, we had a great time. She's, a, but she's an amazing person. However you see her on TV is how she is in her house. And she's the same. She's a true miracle worker. Um, and she's somebody I would study if I were you too. I mean, she'll like go into a prison and like we'll have a person that has metal and the you know, guard to do the wand and then she'll pray for them and they'll do the one nothing goes on. It's incredible. Okay. Lift up your hands and praise the Lord. I'm done with the two of them. Okay, let me ask this question. This is going to be fun. Um, I'm going to ask the question, and if you know this person's name, respond. What about Bob? What about Bob? Who, who, who knows? Does anybody here know a Bob? Robert, Bob. Well, there's two of them at the assistant living where I can I'm actually looking at you because it's it's about you. Okay. You remember the movie? Oh no. You remember the you remember the movie What About Bob? No, I don't. Okay, let me tell you about What About Bob. <laughs> he, he Bob would drive people nuts <laughs> in his behavior. Okay. So Bob had some issues mm-hmm. that needed to be addressed. Yes. 
Okay? So you know a bomb. Yes, I, I do. You know how many bombs? Two. And how are they doing? One of them moved out, and yeah. the other one's dead. The other one died during Yes. That. And the one that moved out, did he need some help? Yes. Yeah. Did he need some psychological help? Possibly. Yes. Okay, now here's my point. Okay? It's not about Bob. Okay. It's not about Bob. Okay. The Lord wants to use you. Now, we're not talking about your job. Okay. okay? We're talking about you helping people manage their life. Because of your extremely varied experiences that you've gained a lot of knowledge and wisdom and understanding because of things that you have witnessed and things that you have walked through that the Lord has brought you um, through successfully. Okay? And so you need to be alerted to the Holy Spirit when he says this person needs some assistance and help. Right? Yes. It's Bob. <laughs> if I could say that to you symbolically. <laughs> okay? Because when I looked at you, <laughs> uh, see the Lord, okay, look, the Lord has a sense of humor. All right? And so I learned this about God. Um, he has a sense of humor. And so that's how I found you. As when I looked at you, it was like, what about Bob? And then I do, okay, She's got a bomb in her life somewhere by experience. And so this is related. Okay, now, um, some of us are one on one people. We don't like being up in front of a whole bunch of folk. Are you a one on one person? Yeah, I'm more one on one. Yeah. So the Lord's going to use you one on one to really help some people. This will include, this will include intercession. This will include praying for individuals. This will improve, this will include problem solving, helping people see options that they couldn't see before. Um, what fellowship are you in? Uh, this one and the river was talking. Okay. Now some of us, you know, we kind of like mind our own business and we just kind of do our own thing. But would you be willing, through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, kind of stretch out and start to get to know a different group and a different crowd of people? The Lord spoke to me just in the last week about there's somewhere that he told me he wants me to go, start going. Yes, because he wants you to get involved with some other people yes. and develop relationships because he has something for them that he wants to use you for. Yes. Now, you're going to get some benefit, too. Paul said, I long to see you in the book of um, Romans. He said that I may benefit you, but it will benefit from our mutual faith. And so this is the Holy Spirit, because you got some people that you need to help. Okay, once you develop a relationship, and they, they have a sense of who and who and who you are, and then because uh, you got some stories to tell. Okay? And you can teach by storytelling. And by your personal experience of what the Lord has brought you, what he's healed you of, how to overcome grief, how to overcome loss, how to be like a cat that gets thrown off and lands on their feet and gets up and keeps on going. Because some people, they don't know how to get up again. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So you're going to help some people get up and start again, and get a restart and a reset, and so that they'll do well. And so um, the Lord's really going to use you very powerfully. So um, so you're going to help some bombs move out <laughs> of, of the captivity that they were in where they become free. I can, you know, just because it's a good plan of words. Lift up your hands and let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm feeling Sandy. 
Does anybody know of Sandy? Yes. Yes. Who's we? Joy. Okay, who's Joy? We Angela knows Sandy. Okay, so Angela, who else knows Sandy? So you guys, this is the church folks. Yeah. Let me ask you something. Do you know a Sandy? <laughs> <laughs> see, see, see how people do you? <laughs> Jesus. While all y'all talking, she knows she knows a Sandy. Uh-huh. <laughs> when I was looking at her, the Lord said Sandy. And she's going to be silent on me. She's tripping. But it's all right. We're going to get over all of it. <laughs> Don't mean to ignore the rest of y'all. But she's the one. And she gonna hide on me. Like like you can hide from the Holy Ghost. Take off your mask, baby. All right. Who is Sandy? Yeah. And where are you from? Jamaica. Jamaica. All right now. So how long you been here? Do you know anybody here? You know anybody here tonight? Yes. Who you know? <laughs> oh, you know Pastor Tony. Was you there Sunday? Sure. Was you there at the church when I was there Sunday? Yes. I didn't get a chance to get to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you gonna treat me like that now? <laughs> I'm listening. I didn't get a chance to get to you. I didn't get a chance to pray for you. No. I didn't get a chance to minister to you. No. Okay. So, can I pray for your bones? Can I pray for your joints? Yes. Should I pray for your bones? Yes. Should I pray for your joints? Yes. I'm feeling something in my knee right here. It just came out. Maybe I've been hanging around you too much. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I'm feeling something in my feet. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm you know. So, okay, here's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Christ is touched with the feeling of your infirmities. It could be weaknesses, but it could also be sin. So anyway, the Lord's going to do some healing Amen. in your bones and joints with him. What we would call arthritis, he's going to bring healing there. And he's going to do something with this knee and with these feet, with your circulation and all that. Um, I'm feeling pressure right here right now. Huh? Yes. What happened? Yeah, because I'm feeling pain. Yeah, I'm feeling pain right now. But it's, but it's starting to go away. That means you're being healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Father. You know, some of us, we worry too much. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and here's the funny thing about our worry. The Lord always takes care of the very stuff we worry about. But we worry anyway. <laughs> but he always takes care of it, don't he? But you still worry all up to the point that he take care of it. And then after that, after you relieve from that, you find something else to worry about. Right? <laughs> worry about people, you know what I mean? Because you love people. But the Lord always works it out. Right? He's faithful. He's going to do it. All right? So this guy's a healing minister on a lot of things. So he's going to lay hands on you for healing. Jesus. Go ahead, sir. Let's all pray for her healing. Come on, pray for her. Thank you, right now. We're almost done. Well, we never get done. We just have to quit.
Let's praise the Lord. That's fine. Here's what I need. Do you have a handkerchief? Do you have another one? Because you've got two children, right? I actually have five. But let's, I think we talked about the two. Yes. Do you have two uh, handkerchiefs. <coughs> Good, give me two. <coughs> this works. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a story. So I was, I was uh, serving at a conference and this man approaches me he had a girlfriend. And his girlfriend had a son that had what's called rapid aging disease. It was in the hospital in that town. And the, the boy had gone totally blind. Rapid aging disease. And so this is on a Friday. The Lord speaks to me and says, Give him a blessed call and send a message that everything will be all right. So that's on a Friday. On Sunday, I meet the mother, pray for her, and the Lord touches her. When the Lord touches her, the boy is in the hospital and he hears a voice say, Everything will be all right. Instantly, his totally blind eyes will pop open and his rapid agency, rapid aging disease disappears and they discharge him to the hospital. Yes. So I was in. Olathe, Kansas, and I'm calling out this woman, I'm prophesying to her. Well, what happened was, is her husband had been in an explosion mm -hmm. and had 80 degree, 80% 80 of his body had been burned. In fact, his hands melted. He was on fire. And so, at some point, we got some pictures of him in the hospital, and hands on bandages. And so, I gave him a cloth. Matter of fact, I gave him a, we have these little ones. So, he puts it on his forehead. And of course, the nurses look at him like he's crazy. <laughs> but the third degree burns all over his body disappeared without any scarring. His hands wow. were totally restored. Yes. And so we actually had him on film testifying. There was no evidence that he had ever been in a fire. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Hallelujah. And so um, we've seen miracles like this doing this here. So let's all agree together yes. that these two children will be healed by Jesus. Yes. Okay? So, Holy Father, I thank you for the prayers of your people. That, Lord Jesus, just like you anointed handkerchiefs in the day of Paul, that you would anoint these handkerchiefs. So that whatever demonic warfare is in the lives of these children or working against them, Lord, may it have to depart in the name of Jesus. And Lord, let miracles happen in the mind and in the bodies of these children so that there's no trace of any sickness or disease. Lord, let your Holy Spirit go with these and let your healing miracle angels also accompany. And Lord, over time, let the children get better and better till there's no evidence they ever had the diseases. And I thank you, Father, for doing it in Jesus' name. You said, well, two or three agree. Yes. It shall be done by the Father. Yes. And we agree. It's written. It's finished. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's get the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think it's Monday night. It's almost 10 o'clock. And so uh, I never get done. I just have to quit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit. I'm going to go in that other room and find a nice easy chair, and I'm going to chillax. Because <laughs> one of the keys to revelation, look at somebody and say rest, rest. rest. then revelation. Rest. So I'm just going to chillax. I got all these snacks that I haven't eaten yet. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got to them yet. They fed us so good yesterday and the day before. And I'm going to have to go on a fast to recover. Come on, let's get food. So she said, can we feed you? I said, no, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. 
I would have been able to wear my clothes. <laughs> but the food was awesome. <clears throat> and sometimes I, I refuse to yield to the Holy Spirit of self-restraint. <laughs> Particularly when it comes to food. I got issues. <laughs> so give Jesus a big hand clap. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So I just want to say, please don't run out because Father knows that he has needs. And yes, he might have issues, but he has needs. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Tony just, Prophet Tony, he, he just honestly came. And there was no fee. There was no, and, 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 and I'm new at this stuff. Let me tell you, I had a quick understanding. <laughs> I'm like, Mm. You're serious. Business side. But every every place that I have ever been taught at, when it comes to prophetic, Prophet Kim Clement, when you come, give unto a prophet and you will receive a prophetic reward. I'm not asking you to dig in your deep. I'm asking you to ask the Holy Spirit exactly what you are to give. Exactly what you are to give as an offering unto the Father, not unto the prophet, unto the Father, not unto the man. And I'm asking you to just take a couple of moments. God, that was me hitting this. Could you play some music? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and just take a moment in time, and just in prayer, and just a moment, and we will be, yes, yes. And we will be handing around a basket in just a moment, but I want you all to take just a moment and pray. What we are doing is everything that we are receiving goes directly to Tony. So if you are making out a check, I need you to write Tony Kemp. T-O-N-Y K-E-M-P if you want to give by cash app or PayPal, I need to hand a microphone to my assistant because you can give that to the aim for the heart and it will be given directly to him. So hold on. Cash app and PayPal, you can find us by our email address. It's A E M. F O R T H E H E A R T at gmail.com. Aim for the heart. A E M F O R T H E H E A R T at gmail.com. And that's for Cash App and PayPal. Yes, aim for the heart at gmail.com yes it would be a e m f o r t h e h e a r t at gmail.com cash app and paypal
getting systemed. We're getting ordered. Hallelujah. And you know it because you've seen you've seen it grow.